morning everyone uh, as you all know uh, this is our second week of our asco in house asco update last week uh, we had a session on head and neck and thorax uh, this week uh, we are focusing on breast cancer uh, the first uh, topic is uh, from the department of surgical oncology the title of the abstract is uh, long term oncological outcomes after omitting axillary surgery in older women with early stage not negative breast cancer a systematic uh, review and uh, meta analysis uh, so the surgical management of the breast cancer has enormously changed from radical mastectomy to uh, breast conservation surgery uh, regarding the axilla so that is changed from the routine axillary dissection to sentinel lymph node biopsy so uh, to present the topic i invite dr govin uh, from the surgical oncology and to chair the session i invite dr shafiq a consultant from surgical oncology submission abstract in the asco updates uh, long term oncological outcomes after omitting axillary surgery in older women with early stage node negative breast cancer it was a systematic review and meta analysis by mariam rana et al in 2016 uh, so choosing wisely study recommended the omission of routine sentinel lymph node biopsy in early stage clinically node negative hormone receptor positive her2 negative breast cancer in women more than or equal to 70 years age although data supporting this was limited this study aimed to examine the long term impact of omitting axillary staging in elderly women undergoing surgery for early stage clinically node negative breast cancer it is a systematic review and meta analysis uh, the various research papers and uh, abstracts from the medline and embase uh, were taken and uh, the randomized and observational studies which compared women uh, aged more than or equal to 70 years of age early stage clinically node negative breast cancer undergoing surgery for breast cancer with or without axillary staging were included in this meta analysis it included studies which should had at least one of the following outcomes that is axillary recurrence which was the primary outcome 
disease free survival breast cancer specific survival and overall survival the risk ratios were calculated as summary estimates for all outcomes a weight pooled mean difference and 95% class interval was calculated using a random effects inverse variance meta analysis for each outcome heterogeneity was calculated using i square statistics and explored using meta regression the newcastle ottawa scale was used to assess the methodological quality of eligible trials uh, based on the selection of patients comparability of cohorts and the methods of outcome assessment the results uh, nine studies were eligible for meta analysis including data for about 48500 patients for the primary outcome of axillary recurrence data for 3591 patients was meta analyzed axillary staging was found to reduce the risk of axillary recurrence compared to no axillary staging although this was not statistically significant uh, the risk ratio was 0.59% with a p value of 0.21 for overall mortality data for around 15000 patients was meta analyzed and the statistically significant protective effect of axillary staging on overall mortality was demonstrated which has a significant p value of less than 0.05 but here the i square value which shows the heterogeneity of study was about 78% uh, no significant differences were observed in disease free survival and breast cancer specific survival conclusion omission of axillary staging or uh, axillary surgery to stage the axilla may be associated with higher risk of overall mortality in older women with early stage breast cancer compared to those who undergo axillary surgery omission of axillary surgery in this population should be carefully tailored to the individual patient taking into consideration the comorbidities life expectancy and formal measure measures of frailty Uh, randomized trials are required to further explore the oncologic safety of omitting this surgery in women aged more than 70 years undergoing breast cancer surgery. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, can we have a slide, please? Perfect. So, uh, good morning to all of you, both uh, uh, offline and online. So, I would like to discuss. Uh, on two regards number one is regarding the quality of the study and number two is with regard to the clinical implications so uh, quickly i'll just go through the each of the slides and point out few facts with the prelude that it is unfair unjust and probably precocious to uh, you know comment or critique on a systematic review seeing just the abstracts not even a presentation but uh, when you see such a presentation one you can't ignore it because it's an important issue uh, since uh, a sizable proportion of uh, breast cancer patients occur in elderly and they are uh, very often under treated and uh, uh, numerous reasons for the same uh, not in the least the fact that they are uh, often left out of most uh, clinical trials um, and most of them do have uh, a biologically favorable cancers which also makes us uh, you know uh, lessen our uh, treatment uh, so uh, this study is coming from a, one of the most reputed uh, centers for clinical research in the world the harvard ts scan uh, scan school of public health so and it's a very relevant study because of uh, what i just mentioned next slide please now the choosing wisely uh, is a very popular uh, um, uh, initiative throughout the world which has been uh, uh, helping us uh, optimize our treatment recommendations based on uh, available evidence and this made the uh, recommendation that uh, in early stage clinically non negative hormone receptor seminally patients uh, even a sentinel node biopsy can be Uh, omitted in 2016 although the uptake of this recommendation is still not uh, uh, uniform now this study the main objective was to examine the long term impact of omitting axillary staging next now uh, this is a systematic review and a meta analysis now starting uh, with the methodology what they have mentioned is that their number one is the comprehensiveness of the search they have looked at uh, medline database and m based database Now, if you follow the guidelines for doing a systematic review or meta analysis, 
perhaps I would say if they have respected their search to these two databases, it's a little uh, less because uh, there are several other databases which need to be included, like the uh, the most important one, which I would say is the central registry from Cochrane, and also other like the Sinal and several other uh, databases. In addition to that, uh, to ensure the robustness of a meta-analysis or systematic review, you're supposed to look at both published and unpublished literature. So unpublished literature would refer to conference proceedings and also looking at trial registries. So uh, that aspect is missing, which you would like to see in the final, uh, uh, when the final full text of the presentation is made. So what this leads to is that what we all know as publication bias. So in the, uh, hope to see a funnel plot uh, and then you see the publication bias when the full text is published. Now coming to the inclusion criteria, uh, they have mentioned the elderly, early stage, clinically non-negative, undergoing surgery, with or without axillary staging. Two factors which require more clarification is with regard to the tumor biology. Now we know that uh, axillary deaspiration is always talked about mostly in the context of luminal age and breast, but uh, this inclusion criteria does not mention whether how much was the uh, luminal age and breast uh, and how much was the other adverse biology. Second thing is, what was the exact axillary staging that was included? Is it only sentinel node biopsy? Is it low axillary sampling? Is it axillary dissection? So there needs to be some clarity on that, which will probably come in the full text. Next. Now the outcome measures which uh, they have selected seem to be appropriate uh, in par with most of the published studies. Next. Now uh, the summary estimate they have chosen is risk ratio, again acceptable. They have gone for a random effect uh, model for this meta-analysis. Now we know that there are two types of uh, models that underlies meta-analysis. One is the random effect, the other is the pixel effect. Now when you have uh, this, there are a lot of assumptions underlying use of either of these. Mostly, if when heterogeneity in the included studies is more, let us say that it is safe to use a random effects model. So uh, this is uh, appropriate. Then heterogeneity was calculated using i square statistics, which is also uh, appropriate. The last part is new sample Ottawa scale. That is the tool that they have mentioned that they have used to look at the validity of the study. Now, they have also mentioned that randomized trials and observational studies were included. But uh, Newcastle Ottawa is only for observational studies. We don't have any data on uh, what they have used, uh, whether they have used the Cochrane tool for assessing randomized trials. Next. Uh, so let us look at the outcomes. The axillary staging, the one of the, the primary outcome was axillary staging was found to reduce the risk of recurrence, but this was not statistically significant. The I square value is what I would like you to focus here, apart from the lack of statistical significance. It's 46.6%, which implies moderate uh, amount of heterogeneity. Next. For overall mortality, the uh, it was found to be significant, but the issue is, the, again, the very high heterogeneity that is denoted by the I-square. Any I-square more than 50% indicates uh, substantial heterogeneity. And last, no significant differences were observed in the DFS and breast cancer studies. So, next. Now, regarding the conclusions of the trial, omission uh, uh, of axillary staging may increase overall mortality. I don't think that is a conclusion which we can take reliably from this study because of the fact that the I square or the heterogeneity was uh, significant. And uh, the second factor is what we actually, second statement that they have made is what we actually follow in clinical practice. There is no uniform generalized recommendation for this group of patients. We have to make tailor-made recommendations based on the life expectancy and comorbidities. Now, uh, this was regarding the methodological quality. To sum it up, regarding the clinical pr uh, practice application, uh, what is required, I feel, is a individualized risk stratification of these patients rather than uniform generalized recommendation. There have been several uh, 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 methods or several attempts in this regard. After the choosing wisely uh, recommendation was released, there was a very important study uh, which was published in 2017 in Annals of Surgical Oncology by Ben Shetal, where they have identified low risk criteria in this elderly age group, more than 70, who can safely avoid axillary staging. The criteria they used was grade one tumors less than two centimeters and grade two tumors uh, less, uh, grade two tumors less than one centimeter. So if this is the low risk category, uh, uh, if this criteria is followed, the chance of nodal positivity was 7.8% when as opposed to 22.8% higher. Another thing that we can use to individualize our decision making is the use of nomograms, several of which
techniques have been validated to predict the known positivity, like the MD and Ritzel and the MS case. So the idea that is the way to go forward in this uh, process. Thank you. Uh, we are moving on to the second topic. Uh, in breast cancer and abdomen syndrome, uh, we heard about the CD, use of CDJ versus inhibitors with a uh, molar key trial. And we have one more trial uh, uh, that is present at the ASCO, that is a Natali trial. Uh, it is present on a Natali trial and an update on molar key. I invite uh, Dr. Bhavika uh, from Medical Oncology and to share the session, I invite Dr. Thomas. Uh,
same between similar between uh, both drugs with febrile neutro uh, neutropenia being the most common followed by liver related toxicities and UT prolongation the most common cause for discontinuation of ribocyclic liver, uh, liver related toxicities conclusion Nadali with its primary endpoint demonstrating a statistically significant improvement in invasive disease free survival and this benefit was consistent across all the pre specified groups and also the secondary endpoints also favored ribocyclobam and uh, it was well tolerated so this trial uh, supports the uh, use of ribocyclic plus aromatase inhibitor in a, uh, patients with uh, stage 2 or 3 hormone positive HER2 negative patients at a risk of recurrence including those patients with non negative now coming to the next study uh, this is updates of the monarch e trial Monarchy uh, was a trial comparing uh, using the uh, use of adjuvant abamacyclic in patients with hormone positive HER2 negative. But this uh, group of patients in this study, Monarchy included only non positive patients. Non negative uh, patients were not included in this study. So the, this is the inclusion criteria with uh, non positive disease. Two arms were abamacyclic and endocrine therapy alone. And this is the update of the study comparing the benefit in two good set of patients age wise less than 65 years and more than or equal to 65 uh, this uh, both the ages uh, both the age groups the benefit was similar uh, with the abama cyclic and adverse effects also were similar between the two age groups but here uh, the most common side effects were diarrhea and fatigue so then coming to the conclusion in patients with hormone positive HER2 negative high risk uh, this is non positive uh, group they have included early breast cancer adjuvant amoeban cycle plus endocrine therapy showed a consistent benefit here also the uh, um, primary endpoint was invasive disease free survival and secondary endpoint was uh, distant relapse free survival uh, uh, as expected this older patients had higher ECOG performance status and medical comorbidities uh, but the adverse effects rates were similar between the age groups and quality of life was also preferred between the uh, both the age groups so this data Monarchy update supports the use of adjuvant abamacyclic across the age groups. <coughs> Coming to just a comparison between this Natali trial and Monarchy trial, both are phase 3 randomized trials. Duration of treatment in Natali trial ribocyclic was given for 3 years, Monarchy abamacyclic was given for 2 years. Inclusion criteria Natali included a broad population including node negative high risk patients, Monarchy included only node positive patients. Age subgroup analysis was done in Monarch E trials less than 65 and more than 65. Median follow up was uh, in Natali trial 34 months, Monarch E it was 42 months. Endpoints were invasive disease free survival in both uh, arms and distant disease free survival in the Natali arm <coughs> and distant, uh, actually distant recurrence free survival in Monarch E. The toxicity wise, ribocyclic had more uh, liver abnormality toxicities. And uh, Abama cycle had diarrhea and fatigue as the most common. Thank you, Dr. Gopika. She has covered almost all relevant aspects of both these trials. So, this Natali and Monarchy trials, they tried to uh, answer or uh, the unmet need in uh, intensifying the adjuvant treatment in hormone positive, HER2 negative, early breast cancer groups. Both these trials, uh, the Natali, it includes both not negative and not positive early breast cancer groups and monarchy not positive alone. Both these trials, uh, they had a statistically significant invasive disease free survival. Almost 25% risk reduction in uh, Natali and in monarchy 34% risk reduction. There were limitations for both these studies. First is the study design. Whether it was statistically uh, the the endpoints are statistically significant, but are these uh, endpoints clinically relevant? That was one thing. Second one, uh, invasive disease free survival. The, is that a surrogate for OS? Not really. It might be in uh, HER2 positive disease, but not in uh, hormone positive HER2 negative disease. Third thing, uh, that's a subpopulation, BRCA positive group. That was not included in the study. So in BRCA positive group, in adjuvant setting, you can uh, along with hormone treatment, we can give ARP inhibitors like Olaparib. So, whether to go for Olaparib or to combine with CDK4 inhibitors or CDK4 inhibitor alone, that was not addressed in this trial. Four, the side effect profile. 
you can see that uh, neutropenia almost 60 patient 60 percent of patients had neutropenia second one is liver related toxicities with ribocyclic gi adverse effects especially diarrhea with uh, abima cyclic then qtc prolongation uh, and some people had uh, rarely sepsis events also and finally the most important thing is the cost uh, this ribocyclic per month around 50000 for 2 years it will be costing more than around 8 to 10 lakhs for the 2 year treatment and uh, bima cyclic again uh, around 75000 to 1 lakh per month for 2 years it will be the patient will have to spend more than uh, 10 to 15 lakhs the cost is a major issue for these trials so to sum up for the take home messages for these trials they try to address an unmet need to intensify the adjuvant treatment second are this practice changing yes they can be uh, not positive high risk disease abimacyclib can be considered but ribocyclib with the not negative group we need more follow-up the worst trend was not significant uh, perhaps we may need a longer follow-up that, that's my take thank you Abhima, both the trials, Natali and Monarchy, over, the trend was towards an over survive, o, overall survival benefit was there. So maybe we will have to follow for them for a long time, wait for further analysis. Why is it not Visually unrecognizable tumor, heterogeneity from multi-parametric MRI images, 
prior to and after new urgent chemotherapy and predict the PCR based on the precise analysis to specific molecular subtypes of breast cancer. So our study aims to develop ensemble learning models using longitudinal multiparametric MRI to predict the PCR for each molecular subtype of breast cancer. So this was a retrospective study conducted from July 2015 to December 2021 and the primary cohort was used on the main hospital along with three external validation cohorts from three other hospitals which comprised 1434 patients initially. Inclusion criteria include all the patients with non-invasive in breast cancer with pathological, clinical and MRI data and the exclusion criteria were those with bilateral breast cancer and metastatic disease or any other malignancy. So the methodology included collecting the images from the pre and post NAC MRI and the images mainly predominantly which we used were diffusion contrast enhanced MRI images which were cropped and segmented and included the largest section slice of the tumour along with its 5 mm border. These were inserted into a deep learning model training network which was formed by the Resident 50 framework and the features were extracted. The extracted features which we got were deep learning features and delta deep learning features. And the delta deep, deep learning features were the longitudinal uh, chain of tumours. And this was subjected to various algorithmic tests which included U-test, Boroto test and Lasso regression test to select the most uh, important features for each subtype of breast cancer. Then the model construction evaluation was done using scientific learning package and the primary cohort was used for model construction with repeated cross validation. The best performing models in the primary cohort was then used to test the external validation cohorts. So these were the results which we obtained. Finally, 1,262 patients were retrieved after excluding 172 patients and the mean interval between two MR examinations was 171.5 days. 441 patients achieved PCR which amounted to 34.9% and the PCR rates for each cohort were as follows. Primary cohort with 38.4%, Validation cohort 1 with 36.2%, Validation cohort 2 with 29.4% and Validation cohort 3 with 32.4%. These were the PCR rates from each molecular subtype and it was the maximum for HER2 positive subtype which amounted to 54.3% followed by TNBC subtype, TN37.5% and the least was for hormone receptive positive HER2 negative subtype 10.6%. Finally, 20, 15 and 13 features were selected to construct the machine learning models in hormone positive HER2 negative, HER2 positive and TNBC subtypes respectively. For all the three subtypes, the stacking model either the highest area under the curves in primary as well as external validation cohorts. So this is a table showing the basic characteristics of the tumours uh, in all the four cohorts and we come to know that the age and the clinical staging uh, had no significant uh, differences in the PCR achieved patients as well as non-PCR achieved patients in all the four cohorts but there were significant differences in the other basic characteristics. These are the plots showing the ROC curves of the stacking, pre, post and delta models in four different cohorts which include the primary cohort, validation cohort 1, validation cohort 2 and validation cohort 3 of the three molecular subtypes that is uh, HR positive, HER2 positive and TNDC and it showed that the area under the curve was maximum for the stacking model which is depicted by the blue line as seen. As seen. This table showed that in all subtypes, the sensitivities, specificity and negative predictive value of stacking model outperformed and was maximum for all the stacking models in all the four cohorts. These models accurately predicted the PCR in all the three validation cohorts and the post model had the highest mean of area under curves than the other two single modality models among the validation cohorts. So to conclude, this study established a novel tool to predict the responses of breast cancer to new adjuvant chemotherapy and then achieved excellent performance. And for breast cancer patients, this model can help surgeons decide on breast conservation surgery and central nuclear biopsy after new adjuvant chemotherapy. Thank you. So this is the first and only study that have used uh, longitudinal MRI uh, as well as radio mix uh, to find out, to predict uh, pathological uh, complete response. Although the uh, methodology is uh, quite exhaustive because they have used uh, radio mix uh, and deep learning techniques. 
So basically, what they have done is uh, uh, they have uh, found out uh, after model pre-construction, four models were uh, finally uh, discovered, and out of that, the stacking model uh, was the best among the uh, all, all the four models. So uh, what we can do is when uh, if we can input the pre uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and post neoadjuvant chemotherapy MRI images to the stacking model, it will tell us whether uh, complete response uh, will be attained or not prior to surgery. And with that, uh, it may help the surgeon to uh, de-escalate uh, the surgery or not. And uh, one, uh, this, uh, the limitations are, uh, this is uh, uh, retrospective data. So prospective data and more clinical trials were needed for this. And also, uh, it was done only in the Chinese populations. Uh, so more larger clinical trials uh, and uh, larger uh, studies are required uh, for more external validation. And only the uh, pre-NAC and uh, post uh, NAC images were seen, uh, were inputs so over here. The mid uh, new adjunct chemotherapy mid images were not taken. So if that is also incorporated, maybe we can get a better data. Thank you. Thank you. Basically, the uh, new adjunct concept is uh, very well rooted in uh, breast cancer. So the problem here is, uh, the, I don't know whether the MRI is useful in predicting the pathology. It's, yeah, basically, the basic aim of all this uh, has been shifted to getting a, a pathology with CR after the inversion therapy. So the uh, current trend is for molecular imaging, uh, and thereby you predict uh, that the patient is, uh, can be spared of uh, further uh, treatment, like uh, either surgery, avoiding surgery, or avoiding chemotherapy. Uh, and people are going away from the chemo and uh, uh, radical surgeries. So I don't know whether the, uh, the MRI can predict the pathological CR because the uh, same problem is there with the, uh, the rectum also. But uh, rectum, uh, the MRI scores over uh, uh, the molecular imaging. Yes, sir. So this, uh, the uh, previous studies have just used only uh, pure MRI alone. And that the, the sensitivity of those uh, studies are only around 63 percent. So that is why here the importance of this study is they have used radiomics, incorporated all the molecular subtypes, and uh, after uh, many validation only, they have come to the conclusion. So that is the importance of this study with, uh, after using radiomics. So the, in the same ASCO meeting, uh, the uh, there was another paper. Uh, which uh, the, the study design was very uh, unique, like uh, the HER2 positive breast cancer people are started. Uh, people have uh, used uh, two antibodies, trastuzumab uh, and pertuzumab, without chemotherapy. And after two cycles, they uh, took uh, Pepsi. And then, uh, 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 they just uh, uh, saw whether uh, the pathologist here or the, uh, the response can be uh, detected uh, from the uh, two after two cycles, and if so, then they will go for uh, surgery. And if there is a, a respiratory disease, then uh, chemotherapy will be added as side therapy. Just deviating from the standard uh, uh, protocol. So again, uh, they are they are utilizing the predictability of uh, pet CT in. Uh, Something similar we also can decide. Thank you. Uh, okay, moving on to the next topic. Next is a very uh, important trial uh, for the ASCO 2023. That is the Sonia trial. So could patients do just well uh, without CDK for six individuals in the past life and consequently delay the extra cost and toxicities associated with CDK for six individuals? To present the topic, I invite Dr. Mohir from the Department of Medical Oncology and to chair the session, I invite Dr. Narayan Mukhlaaj sir, the Director, India CCR. Good morning. Uh, today I am presenting about uh, Sonia trial. Which is from uh, which is published uh, presented in ASCO 2023 from uh, Netherlands. The background of the study is CDK for six inhibitors uh, showed improved outcome of patients with advanced breast cancer in first and second line. But the first line use is associated with the prolonged side effect and higher uh, drug cost. 
So uh, the trial design is patients with the hormone positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer with pre and post menopausal women and includes with the uh, neo adjuvant chemotherapy allowed provided the DFS is more than one year, no cryotherapy for advanced breast cancer, no visceral crisis. Total uh, 1050 patients are included and they were randomized in one is to one ratio and they were stratified again by uh, the type of CDK46 inhibitor used, visceral disease present or not, or prior neuroadjuvant endocrine treatment. There were two arm, one arm received non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors plus CDK inhibitors, the other arm non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors only. Upon progression, uh, the uh, combination arm received further strength and the other arm received further strength plus CDK46 inhibitor combination. The primary endpoint of the study was PFS2, which is the uh, time period from uh, randomization to second progression. The other uh, secondary endpoints of the study include quality of life, overall survival, and cost effectiveness. Coming to the baseline characteristics, uh, uh, the baseline characteristics are well balanced in the both arm. The median age is around 63 years. Uh, eight, 87 patients, 87 percent of the patients are postmenopausal. Uh, around uh, 40 percent of the patients uh, received chemotherapy, and 49 patients, 49 percent received endocrine therapy. Uh, regarding the CDK6 inhibitor use, the palbociclib was the most common. Around 91 percent of the patients uh, received palbociclib. Uh, if you look at the trial overview, the uh, trial has happened in 2017, November to September 2021, with a median follow-up of 37 months. The key thing is uh, the regarding the median duration of CDK46 inhibitors. If uh, the CDK46 inhibitor used in first line, the median duration of uh, CDK46 is to around 24.6 months. If it is used in second line, the median duration was uh, eight months, almost three times uh, more in the uh, regarding the duration in the first line. Coming to the uh, PFS in the first line, uh, uh, first line setting, uh, we can see the curves are well separated. The median PFS is uh, 24 months in the combination arm compared to aromatase inhibitor, single uh, aromatase inhibitor. It is uh, in line with other uh, pivotal trial like Paloma 2, Monarch 2 and Mona Lisa. The hazard ratio is quite significant with the 0.59. But uh, as for the trial design, upon progression, the cross arrow has happened. And after that, uh, uh, the curves is showing it is uh, coming close to each other. That means the effect has uh, slowly disappeared. Also, the hazard ratio is 0.87, which is non-significant. The median PFS of the first line CDK is 31 versus 26.8 in the second line. Again, overall survival, uh, the curves are uh, crossed the, with the hazard ratio of 0 0.98, with the, uh, which is a non-significant. The median PFS of first line is 45.9. And the second line setting is the median OS was 53.7. If you look at the uh, subgroup analysis, uh, other than the neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, not received patients, the uh, all other patients, the first line or second line uh, showed no much difference. Regarding the quality of life, uh, uh, the analysis are still uh, ongoing. There is no difference in the fact B total score between the study arm. Regarding the safety summary, as expected, neutropenia, liver function, abnormalities, anemia, and thrombocytopenia was uh, there. Uh, and around 42 percentage more grade, more than or equal to grade 3 adverse events was seen in the CDK46. Um, because as we know, the first line setting it is around uh, three times more in, uh, duration uh, regarding the duration in the first line setting. Maybe that is the reason for the more toxicity in the first line setting. So summary, it, uh, CDK46 inhibition in the first line setting does not improve progression free survival, it does not improve overall survival, does not improve quality of life 
and uh, it extends time so you can give it by uh, 16.4 months with the grade 3 for top city by 42 percentage and it also increased the drug expenditure by 200 uh, thousand dollar per patient so uh, the conclusion is Sonia challenges the need of first line use of CDK for CDK inhibitor and endocrine monotherapy remains an excellent option especially in the first line. Uh, there are some uh, limitation of the study. Uh, uh, one is uh, regarding the uh, standard of care. This, this study was happened in 2017 at that time uh, the trial followed the standard, care, standard of care pathway but now we know uh, in the second line setting uh, we have other uh, targeted uh, treatment in the hormone positive metastatic breast cancer like PIK3 and uh, ESR mutant patients. So uh, that's a, uh, one limitation. The other one is the choice of CDK for 6 inhibitor. inhibitor. Even though there is no head to head comparison, uh, we have uh, other uh, better toxicity problem CDK for 6 inhibitor. Also, uh, we have the data of ribocyclic with the overall survival benefit. So, uh, this trial uh, changing the practice, we need uh, some more uh, uh, evidence. But obviously, uh, regarding uh, one subgroup of patients, that is uh, some uh, geriatric survey showed that uh, the elderly people who are preferring uh, uh, the better quality of life, life rather than the longevity. So, uh, the, when a patient who are elderly with a frail patient, considering the toxicity, uh, as for this trial, uh, uh, delaying the CDK46 inhibitor for the second line is a good option. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you go back to the, uh, the trial design? Uh, two, two, three points. Like uh, this, this is one study which got maximum attention during the last uh, 2023 ASCO. The reason being, uh, this study was supported by insurance uh, people, not by any pharma. So that is one thing. And second thing is, uh, almost uh, uh, all uh, patients uh, got enrolled uh, voluntarily uh, without any uh, direction from the treating uh, physician. So. And the third, as Muriel said, uh, there is a total savings of $20 billion uh, in this study. So there was a standing ovation after the, the Sonia trial in uh, ASCO 2023. But if you look at the uh, trial design, you can see that uh, uh, here the, basically uh, this was uh, designed in 2017 where then uh, was the only drug available uh, CDK, uh, only CDK46 inhibitor available. And we know that fibrocyclic uh, uh, has no uh, always advantage and uh, further the uh, second generation molecules like ribocyclic and uh, uh, adenocyclic as uh, energy over the fibrocyclic. So that was not an ideal situation. Then the median age of the patient population was 64. That showing that the uh, majority of the patients were elderly population. And that was one of the main issues. And uh, we, uh, can you go back the trial design? Then? So this is another uh, the, the trial. Uh, the randomization is uh, the no uh, steer one is uh, non steroidal uh, aromatase inhibitor plus CDK46 inhibitor appointment versus only aromatase inhibitor uh, 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 as a single line. So uh, once the patient focuses on the combination, they were not uh, receiving CDK46, another CDK46 inhibitor, or manipulate or the, or the modification of the uh, no, uh, endocrine therapy. So that is something which is unique uh, for this. Those who have focused after uh, the combination were not offered any other CDK46 inhibitor. And uh, uh, the second uh, PFS, uh, so, uh, compared to the second uh, PFS, is the uh, no steroidal arrow with this inhibitor, that is a single endocrine uh, arm, has got a, a better uh, second PFS. And when you consider the OS, uh, the both arm, the OS is almost same. So, that shows that uh, uh, at least some, uh, there's a group of patients you can very well spare the toxicities of CDK46 inhibitor uh, in the metastatic setting. Uh, if you start or if you delay the uh, exposure of CDK-46 inhibitor. 
So, uh, how to identify that population? It's basically uh, uh, on the aseptic disease, uh, no volume disease, elderly population, and there are a lot of uh, comorbidities. And these are the uh, uh, population uh, that are going to be benefited by uh, uh, delaying CDK process in the uh, uh, That uh, group. Then, uh, coming to the conclusion, just uh, the last but slide, uh, uh, before the slide, yeah. So here, the, basically, you can see that uh, the, uh, the, uh, CDK, the delaying uh, or the giving CDK for 6 6 uh, incubator after the operation, uh, the second case is about 16.5 uh, months, which is much better than uh, 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 giving offering up front. So uh, uh, the take home message from this study is not all metastatic uh, hormones of a positive or negative patients require a combination of CDK plus 6 CD plus uh, uh, hormone. At least a subgroup of patients uh, you can delay uh, giving uh, CDK plus 6 CD and that will save a lot of uh, 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 the cost as well as uh, the determinant of quality of uh, life of the patients. So uh, this, these two are the major take home from this trial. Then uh, we have said uh, about the limitations. Uh, the one is the, uh, there are better uh, CDK for 6 inhibitors now, and also younger populations were not included in the trial. So these are two caveats of this trial. Thank you. Then we, sir, uh, we are moving on to the next topic. Uh, we heard about uh, partial bus radiation in the adjuvant setting in those uh, the cancer patients. Then we have a, a new attack from the ESCO 2023, not from ASCO. It is a preoperative single dose partial bus radiation for any results of the ability of life. To present the topic, I invite uh, Dr. Arya from the uh, Department of Radiation Oncology. And in the chair the session, uh, I invite
started using the uh, phone game CT. So they took around uh, two CTs that is one before the uh, first half and then after the, uh, before the second half. So uh, once the ablative radiation is completed, uh, she was sequentially followed up first week after the radiation, then two months, four months, six months after RT, and uh, six months BCS was scheduled. Uh, but if, if there are any signs of uh, disease progression, uh, earlier it was done. Then later the BCS uh, duration was changed up to eight months. Then the surgical specimen was assessed for radiotherapy response. Then uh, this is. Uh, uh, by pathology using uh, HIV examination and cytotherapy LEC was being done and the pathological response was noted. Then after uh, that follow-up visits, uh, she will be coming in both surgical and uh, radiation oncology opening and uh, yearly mammography was also done and if the systemic therapy was whenever indicated, she was offered uh, for that and uh, other cosmetic outcomes and patient reported outcomes were also observed during this follow-up visit. So basically the other interventions uh, coming initially uh, we had a sentinel biopsy then MRI uh, as I mentioned that uh, one week, two, four, six and uh, twelve months and then for, after that later on a mammogram was there and all the uh, other um, cosmetic outcomes and quality of life assessment studies were carried out for that. So initial uh, paper they published was in 2019. So in this, uh, so in, uh, they have, uh, according to the uh, criteria, around 25 uh, patients had to be enrolled for a patient sample right? But they had around 36 patients, so uh, and nobody was lost to follow up. So among that, 15 uh, had an BCS at the enroll of 6 months, and 21 patients at the enroll of uh, 8 months. The patient characteristic was uh, um, almost uh, like, Median age was around 65 years, tumor diameter was around uh, 1.2 centimeter, and uh, six patients had received neoadjuvant endocrine treatment, that is uh, retrofor, which was given after the uh, radiation, that is during the months between radiation and surgery. And uh, grade was almost 24% uh, of grade 1, and uh, histology was of type 12. So coming to the pathological uh, response, it was done by the use of criteria. That is the uh, complete response, near complete, partial, and stable disease. Complete means there was no invasive component or only rectal carcinoma in situ was there. Near complete is uh, less than 10 percent of the resident tumor was remaining, and uh, partial means uh, um, 10 to 50. And if there more than 50 percent of tumor was remaining, it was uh, considered stable disease. So out of the uh, 36 patients, uh, uh, total 15 uh, had complete response. Of them, uh, 5 out of 15 were who underwent BCS uh, at 6 months. And for those uh, 21 patients who underwent BCS at 8 months, 10 had pathological complete response. And 12 had uh, near, near complete response, 7 had partial response, and 2 had stable disease. There are no patients uh, without no response. Coming to the uh, toxicity, uh, so here uh, the main uh, uh, toxicity of the breast, breast fibrosis. Around 31 uh, patients, that is 86 person had grade 1 uh, breast fibrosis during the initial phase, that is before BCS. And uh, nearly all patients, 100% of the patients had breast fibrosis at 12 months and um, 18 months. Then other complaints were breast discomfort and pain because uh, 21 uh, patients had that is 50% had during uh, the initial uh, for, initial follow up, but later on they showed a decreasing trend. Then coming to breast for breast edema also, uh, it was at a higher number initially. Uh, then after 12 months it rose up. Then it was showing the decline. Then wound infection uh, was also observed in uh, some five patients in greater uh, wound infection. They were required mandatory treatment. And one patient required a, 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 a incision and release procedure. So after they found out this, they started giving perioperative antibiotics and further uh, no such complications were observed. So this was the uh, patient with uh, graph showing the radiological response. So it is having a, a rising trend. That is, as the months progress, the uh, response rate was more. So uh, and here they um, found out the positive predictive value and Uh, that is around uh, after 15, uh, uh, this also 15 patients had a radiological complete response in the 
takes one mm -hmm. MRI. Uh, out of them, but only 10 patients mm -hmm. are having uh, actual pathological response. So the positive predictive value was around 67%. Mm -hmm. And coming to the uh, negative predictive value, um, uh, around uh, mm, uh, the 76% uh, was the negative predictive surgery in a carefully selected group of uh, uh, low risk early breast cancer and uh, just another the point is that the changing of PCS from 6 months to 8 months showed a PCR or a near PCR in more than 80% of the patients so this is being followed up in an ablative 2 trial which is looking at doing PCR uh, sorry PCS at uh, 12 months so this is uh, just uh, part of many ongoing trials are there the crystal trial all those are there looking at the possibility of avoiding surgery in a selected group of patients. Chemotherapy is not part of the original protocol. Only if indicated later, it is no, it was administered. This is, uh, these are cases which usually go for a partial breast radiation. So the astro, as per the astro criteria, this is a patient having a tumor less than two centimeters in size, no NBSI. Uh, hormone receptor positive or negative? No, that was part of the initial criteria. If the patient had uh, would require chemotherapy, they were not included in the trial. Upfront.
running short of time. Good morning all, I will be presenting about the dynamics and type of uh, ESR1 mutation under aromatase inhibitor or colorless combined with paracocycle after randomization in the PADA1 trial. Uh, now what are these ESR1 mutations? Uh, these are acquired mutations during the aromatase inhibitor therapy in approximately 40% of ER positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer uh, and these rare resistance. Uh, this can be detected by uh, circulating human DNA analysis in the blood and uh, these retain partial sensitivity to fulvish trend uh, which is a selective histogen receptor degrader. Uh, now the strategy is targeting of the rising ESR1 mutations when they become detectable when the patient is taking aromatase inhibitor and parvocycle. Now looking at the study design, uh, in this, uh, this study is divided into three steps, basically in step 1 we include all the aromatase inhibitor sensitive ER positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancers uh, who have had no prior treatment uh, for the same and uh, have been evaluated by the institutional policy. Uh, now, serially, we start the patient on uh, aromatase inhibitor and parvocycle and we monitor the levels of uh, ESR1 mutations. Uh, as I said, this is done by the circulating uh, DNA uh, analysis, tumor cell DNA analysis. And when the patient is having CAA rising values and um, uh, has not had a disease progression yet, uh, the patient is randomized into two. One, these patients are shifted into uh, pal palvistrin with palvocycle and uh, some patients are continued in, uh, uh, with aromatase inhibitors with palvocycle until progression. Uh, now, there was an optional crossover. Uh, those patients who are continued with aromatase inhibitor and palvocycle were later shifted to palvistrin and palvocycle at progression. Uh, now, uh, the uh, primary endpoint was progression free survival. Uh, we had around 1017 patients who were enrolled in step 1, and of them, 283 patients showed rising ESR1 mutation uh, during the study. Uh, now, among these uh, uh, 283 patients, 172 patients were taken up for evaluation and were randomized into 88 patients in the palvistrin with palvocyclib arm and 84 patients with the aromatase inhibitors and palvocyclib arm. Uh, now the uh, median follow up was 28 months uh, and we had around 152 PFS events. Uh, uh, showing this updated results, uh, this palvistrin and palvocyclib arm, the median progression survival was 12.8 months and uh, in the aromatase inhibitors with palvocyclib arm, uh, the median progression free survival was uh, 5.8 months. Clearly the palvistrin with palvocyclib arm had a superiority. Uh, and uh, the uh, hazard ratio was 0.54 uh, and in the optional crossover the uh, progression rate survival was 3.5 months. Uh, the second secondary endpoint that was assessed was PFS2. Uh, PFS2 was nothing but time to second progression or death. Uh, so this in the fulvistrin and palvocyclib arm the uh, uh, PFS2 was 29 months, uh, the median PS of, uh, PS, uh, PFS2 was 29.4 months as opposed to 14 months in the aromatase inhibitor and palvocyclib arm. Uh, now, uh, delving deep into the study, the uh, circulating tumor DNA kinetics, uh, these basically are performed uh, using the PCR assay and uh, the QC and feasibility uh, uh, were the, uh, as, as uh, uh, coping up with the criteria of the PADA1. And uh, the mutation typings were performed in a leftover samples uh, after the NGS study in these patients. Uh, uh, while uh, studying this rising uh, ESR1 mutation, there were several polyclones observed. However, this polyclonality did not affect the outcome of the study. The only thing that they considered was the rising uh, ESR1 mutation. They did not go into the subtype. Uh, uh, the uh, median level uh, of uh, ESR, uh, the rising ESR levels, there was around 14 copies per ml and the uh, range was uh, somewhere between 4 to 1033 and there was no imbalance observed between the two arms. Uh, the uh, rising ESR1 mutations, these were studied at three levels, one at randomization, uh, secondly at two months post the therapy, post randomization and thirdly at the either uh, uh, the crossover or progression. Uh, firstly, when they studied it at randomization, we had 161 patients who had a second uh, uh, DNA result that was available. Uh, now, uh, among the 161 patients, 75 patients did not have uh, any ESR mutations that were detected. And uh, there was no difference between the two arms. This means that they have responded to aromatase inhibitor. Uh, 
Now, at two months of therapy, after randomization, uh, they studied a term called undetectability rate. That is, how many uh, patients were un uh, the ESR1 mutations we could not detect after therapy with either pulvistrand or palocycle or aromatized inhibitor with palocycle. Uh, so, in the pulvistrand and palocycle one, we could, uh, uh, the undetectability rate was 58 out of 85 compared to 25 out of 78 in the aromatized inhibitor arm. So clearly there is a superiority of uh, uh, pulvistrin and palocycle. Uh, 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 the, uh, the basically from this we can conclude that uh, the, the ESR1 status is an independent prognostic factor and another prognostic factor that was studied, uh, that was concluded was the age greater than 60 was also an independent factor. Uh, now, at crossover, uh, we had uh, 144 patients uh, who, were, who had available results at progression uh, and among them around 111 uh, patients were uh, analyzed and they found that in the uh, patients who are continued on aromatase inhibitors and palbocycle at progression also there was 82.7 percentage uh, patients who are still had this ESR1 mutation and uh, this mutation was detected in 73.1 percent uh, in the palbocycle and palbocycle law. So this shows that uh, before progression if we uh, shift the patient to palbocycle it had a better outcome compared to those who uh, in those patients who are already progressed. Uh, 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 that is the limited molecular efficacy of uh, palmistrin in the crossover cohort. Uh, now coming to the conclusions, uh, the uh, progression to survival hazard ratio was 0.54 uh, and uh, it, the uh, progression to uh, time to second progression or uh, uh, death the hazard ratio was 0.37. Uh, the, uh, in months, it is 7 months in the uh, PFS uh, and uh, the second progression at 15.4 months. Uh, the mutation type and polyclonality, like I mentioned, uh, they didn't have any significant predictive impact. Now, at the molecular level, uh, there, there is a uh, superiority of palvistrin and palvocycle over the aromatase inhibitor and palvocycle arm. And uh, this uh, also highlights the limited uh, efficacy of palvistrin and palvocycle when given later at either crossover or uh, either progression. Now, uh, coming to uh, uh, this, uh, with the demonstrated superior activity of palvistrin uh, in such cases, uh, with newer uh, uh, oral uh, CRTs that are being developed, they uh, will be later studied in the PADA1 uh, trial also. This is a typical example of uh, highly personalized medicine in dealing with the metastatic breast cancer. Before your radi what I could understand is that before your radiological progression, you check the blood circulating DNA for ESR1 mutation, and then and there you put the uh, switch the drug to colvestrant, which is uh, supposed to be more effective in, uh, even the, when, you, when you happen to have a ESR1 mutation. This is very relevant because we are going to have more and more. Um, Newer molecules uh, targeting this uh, ESR. So um, uh, maybe <laughs> we need to uh, have more follow up. It's important. So there is a, what I could understand is there is some 39% risk reduction in the progression if you target it before the radiological progression. So we need to, uh, we need, in our setup, we need a lot of validation for this blood circulating uh, ESR1 mutation and all those things. Yes, it is. Uh, that's what solitomer. Solitomer also we are going to have personalized medicine like that. Actually, Paragon uh, has opened a broad uh, world of uh, uh, going molecular and detecting uh, circulating DNA and uh, circulating DNA based uh, tailor new treatment. Uh, for example, in the previous uh, Nadari trial, from the, they are uh, now checking whether. All patients, high risk people, high risk creatures should be subjected to the CDK46 and AI combination rather than uh, selecting patients according to the subject in DNA and thereby using it as a biomarker to identify which of all patients requiring uh, the combination. So, this is basically a new era has started where people are looking at uh, uh, the uh, subjecting DNA. So, that is the importance of the background. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are moving on to the next topic. There are concerns of the false negativity rate of central electron biopsy after neoversion chemotherapy. There is a study, the phase 2 study of feasibility of central electron biopsy for five clinically N0 patients treated with primary chemotherapy C 
you they took around uh, 150 odd cases and uh, they found out the identification rate of a central lymph node after chemotherapy was quite decent that is around 95 to 96% and there were 61 positive nodes out of which 7 were false negative so the whole false negative rate came to around 11.5% Now this is very similar to the trial of Ecosoft 1071, which is a similar study which showed the false negative rate was around 12 percent. But if you look at the study, can you just move the next slide? If you look at the study, they looked at even isolated tumor cells, which is not looked on a uh, clinical. Uh, normally, uh, what we do is we do not look at isolated tumor cells. So your false negative rate comes down to 7.1 percent if you don't look at isolated tumor cells after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. and if you use a dual tracer technique the multiple tracers like you use both your blue dye as well as your technetium 99 sulfur chloride you're going to again bring down your false negative rate and if you get more than one sentinel lymph node again your false negative rate comes down to 10.6% and if you have a low axillary burden to begin with if you have only one nodal metastasis which was detected pre operatively with your multi modal imaging again your false negative rate is low so the take home message is you need a you can do this feasibly in uh, after near joint chemotherapy use a dual tracer if you have only one node again your false negative rate will be very less and also multiple central lymph nodes also bring down your false negative rate so at present in our clinical practice we are we can do this method if we have if we can use a dual tracer technique and if uh, it can we can do a near joint chemo after near joint chemotherapy we can do a central lymph node biopsy say No, but uh, if you look at all the studies which have looked at ITC or micrometastasis or even uh, no without chemotherapy, but even if you look at that initial trial of NACT B zero four, even if you leave behind nodes in the axilla, it is not going to create any overall survival DFS. So that is the trial which began everything. You have total mastectomy with RT, worm total mastectomy again it doesn't make a difference. the use of uh, radio pack leaks that was uh, this uh, clipping of the node was the trial in this it was optional in the echoes of 1071 trial that is they did a ultrasound axilla they found uh, they did a positive node was there and that node was clipped and then chemo was given then that node was again taken out and seen it was gone negative but that is a whole cumbersome process it is just like the sentina trial where they did a central lymph node Before the chemo, then after chemo again a central node. It is not practically possible. I think this is a decent trial where you are just going to give chemo, you uh, and see if it has become node negative both clinically as well as radiologically, and then you address it. So in one year's time, you will know what is the outcome of these patients who have T1, T3 with nodal metastasis. I think selection is probably also key. If you have only one node, low axillary burden, you use your dual tracer. The false negative rate is. coming down and you have a decent uh, pick up rate of 95% so i think this is the way forward axilla is traditionally now going to go down down the escalation almost not doing the axilla you are basically looking at pathological complete response rate so in a triple negative breast cancer axilla response is around 65% and uh, in uh, hgr2 is around 50% So you you're going to get a good amount of pathological complete response rates in axilla and that is what you're trying to see if that complete response rate you don't need to go and go ahead and do the axilla